But it is great to be back home. You know, it's hard to leave Denver. I've been away now 11 years, and every time I come back, I have the same warm welcome. It's just, so thank you so much. And I am going to be joined today by two extraordinary people whose bios are also very long. And I'm going to talk about them from the heart because of ways that I have either observed or worked with them directly and the way that they've touched me. Jackie Bezos has shown and led the way on how you take passion and science and a big idea and you move it forward. And she has dedicated her life to the improvement and improving outcomes and life outcomes for young children. And as I have watched the Bezos Family Foundation really take a user-centered approach to their work in reaching parents of young children and thinking about everyday moments that can be brain-building moments and building on the assets of parents. There's not a single parent in the world that doesn't want to succeed, that doesn't want their child to do really well. And whether you like it or not, all of us who are parents know that in some way, shape, or form, we know how responsible we are for the outcomes that we see in them. And she saw that lever, she saw the strategic driver, and we're gonna hear much more from her directly about that. Thank you so much, Jackie, for being here. And Bob Ross, who it brings his wealth of experience as a clinician, as a public health official, and as a philanthropic leader. And California could not be in a better place with healthcare without the California endowment. And really, Bob's leadership and the foundation's leadership in the implementation of ACA. Uh, we take his lead in the state at the Packard Foundation. And Bob's personal leadership on these issues and his belief in the power of community, in the power of the real voices that are experiencing life on the ground is truly inspiring. He did this, uh, he was the first health funder, I think, ever to give a keynote at the um, Grant Makers for Education a couple of years ago. And he did the Big Ten, and I wish I had written them down because, you know, they were life lessons. But uh, you will hear directly from Bob about community and the power of the voice of the community as a strategic driver. And I think between the two, you really have here the balance of what it's gonna take. And before I invite them up there, I just wanna provide some framing thoughts. You know, we did this phenomenal, what was it? Lift, learn, and lead, and that's been the theme of this. And I offer up two more, because that's really what strategic drivers are about. It's about listen and leverage. And both of our speakers today, if we are really thinking about impact, and I separate impact from outcomes. For years now in the field, we've talked about outcomes. And outcomes are those things that, we, that move the needle and show improvement for discrete, sets of people and organizations. But impact is about achieving sustained change over time, and for that to happen, you really have to have an ecosystem that responds. It's about moving community. It's about moving systems. So it's not just about the intervention and what happens. And for too long, we in philanthropy have really focused on building the evidence, supporting public policy, right, and research, and then really assuming that public policy was gonna create the impact. And I, I think we are here today to say to you that, you know, we all know that that's not enough. We haven't figured out implementation of scale, at scale, and we don't have a theory of scale in the field. 
But we really do, that is the next challenge. And with 300 cities in the grade level reading campaign, that's a challenge I put before you. And as you think about the remarks from our speakers today, I would love for us to think about how we move the needle at scale to achieve strategic impact, but never lose sight of the end user. So with that, I'd love to invite Jackie and Bob to the stage. I want to sit next to Wonder Woman. I know. You just... <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> But, you know, I could be Wonder Woman, too. That's you are Wonder Woman. Likely. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jackie, I'd, we'd love to hear from you about what inspired you to do this, why you picked the strategic driver, and sort of how you moved it forward. So, I, I have to confess to having my own Petri dish. So, I have 11 grandchildren. Um, That's a cohort. It is a cohort. <laughs> it is. I mean, and there's been a rumor that we were trying to take over the world, not, not just through consumerism either. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and it, it's been a blessing to live close to them. So um, three of them live next door to me and cut a hole in my fence for easy access, which is a, I think that's really nice. I could do without the dogs occasionally, but the kids are great. But watching them, have the security they needed to grow into who they would become was one of the driver, personal drivers for me. Um, but I will take, let me back up and forgive my, my need of notes, but I have done one too many talks recently. <laughs> I get confused and I don't know what I'm saying. So, <laughs> um, When my husband Mike and I, along with our three children and their spouses decided to form the Family Foundation about 17 years ago. We began with the belief that early investments in our children would benefit all of us. And not just all of us Americans, but all of us. We should be thinking about this for the planet, not just for some. Um, I know you believe this too, or you wouldn't be here. So I'm in a room with a bunch of kindred spirits and also in a room of people with a sense of urgency because we want to achieve greater outcomes for our children and families. So I'm gonna share some thoughts with you about drivers for impact at the foundation. One of the big drivers for us is we start with the science. That's how we got into this in the first place. We started funding a lot of just really straight up research what is going on in those babies' brains? And how can we find out enough that might create a wave that would create a change and all children would grow up in better um, households? So we fueled new discoveries to advance our understanding of learning and development, funding that basic research. And we actually put tens of millions of dollars into turning um, burning questions into established research. So we wanted to have that to leverage significant government and private support. And I think we're getting to a tipping point there, too. I think mm -hmm. we should feel that. We've got a mess on our hands um, in some ways. But there's enough people now with knowledge that the conversations that we're, being, that we're here overhearing, um, and Ellen Galinsky was just sharing with me that she'd been at the governor's uh, conference, and she said it's just the conversations are different. So we're beginning to get to that critical mass of knowledge. But that doesn't mean parents' lives are changing yet, or children's. Um, so then, you know, we realized that funding the research, even though it was being successful, the research itself was very successful. Um, you could uh, take it and get it published in a journal, which was great, but then it became shelf science and it didn't go any further. And if you were really fortunate, it might be picked up in a newspaper and someone might make a comment on it. But it wasn't getting into the hands, it wasn't translated into actionable moments, it wasn't getting into the hands of parents um, and who could affect the lives of, of their children. So that's, that's where we decided that we were gonna put a big stake in the ground. We were gonna translate the leading science 
from, is it 13 advisors, Ellen? 13 leading advisors across the United States and one in Canada. Um, and one of our scientists is here right now. Phil, will you raise your hand? Yeah. So we asked them when we started out, so give us, you know, the 10 or 20 things that you'd want to say to a parent if you were sitting in a room with a parent. And so they did. And then we thought, well, this is really amazing. How are we going to give it to parents so that they can act upon it? And so that's when Ellen gracefully came in and said, I think I can handle this. Ellen Glensky. Ellen, raise your hand. OK. Um, so we wanted a way to spread the good news broadly so that every parent would have the opportunity to do this and to, to work on being a brain builder. Um, and that's why we, we created a, an intervention or um, what would we say, it's not a program, it's an initiative maybe, and what we're looking for is a culture shift, so nothing small. We want everybody to understand that the first five years of life are precious and we want everybody to be able to act upon those first five years when they come in contact with somebody uh, that's newborn or a toddler. Um, so Vroom is a, a national, international, and now international initiative that helps parents turn routine moments between parent and caregiver and child, like feeding or diaper changing, riding in a car, into brain building moments. We're putting the science directly into the hands of parents, making it actionable in their everyday lives. Vroom includes a mobile app with a thousand plus brain building tips, all unique tips. Thank you, Ellen. A newly launched texting service with, and partnerships with major brands, media companies that are turning their, their real estate on packages or programming to include brain building tips, sparking a moment of joy and interaction. Vroom was developed by scientists, like I said, community leaders and trusted brands but with the input from community organizers and families. So we share the good news from science and inspire parents to apply the science in their daily lives in a way that's easy, accessible, and free. And it's also fun, which doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't hurt. That, may, that is the big bonus. When parents connect with their children, they see their baby's eyes light up. When we tell them that if they see their baby's eyes light up, that their brains are lighting up too, they understand that. And they begin to see themselves in a brand new way as brain builders. Being a brain builder, parents aren't, just aren't simply doing this for the sake of their child. They're doing it for their new image of themselves. And they want to live up to that title, brain builder. Here's how Vroom was born. We'd been funding the science, as I mentioned, but we were puzzled by a way to share it. Um, that's when our work began with IDEO.org, which is a human-centered design firm in San Francisco. So we went to them with you know, much of the science and talked to them about how could we make certain that this is something that's going to resonate with, with children and their parents. And that, they said, oh, that's our specialty. We've got this. So they spent four months going across the United States, going to the non-usual places, interviewing parents in their own homes. They got um, referrals that from, they placed ads on Craigslist. And from Craigslist, they ended up with their very first contact in a community, but then it was all referrals from them. It was never um, a focus group. It was always this beautiful one-on-one -on -one conversation that sometimes took place in the home, but sometimes it was at the church social, and sometimes it was at, on the playground. So they became a part of these families for four months. And I know you're not gonna be surprised by what they found, is all parents love their children. All parents want a better life for their children than the life they had. Um, they want to make a difference in their children's lives, but these particular parents just didn't know how. And so we talked about the science, and we said, do you think you'd like to know more about the science? And they honestly felt like we'd been holding out on them. And I, 
had to say, we weren't holding out on you. We just got this. <laughs> we didn't know what to do with it. So help us build it. And this is what you were talking about. And they did. They helped us build this tool, this science delivery system that we call Vroom. Um, while parents are our key Vroom audience and a strategic driver, ensuring that young children have the best possible start in life is everyone's job. It's everyone's opportunity. Every decision maker should have a stake in this, mayors and, and county leaders, school boards and governors, and every citizen. To build that kind of broad public support for this work, we have to help people understand that every child is born with enormous potential and that early investments pay off. In Colorado, for instance, the marketing of room, you'll find tips in grocery store aisles, on tourism boards at local attractions, and with healthcare providers like the Rocky Mountain Health Clinics that train receptionists to share room messages and materials with families. And you'll find it at a grade level reading coalition, I'm <laughs> proud to say. The Children's Museum of Denver has integrated bilingual brain building prompts throughout the museum, even in unexpected places, like the water fountain, the diaper changing stations, and even the stairs that take you to another floor. At the grassroots community level, Vroom is surfacing through trusted organizations, including 26 grade level reading communities. This might be the neighborhood WIC office, offering mealtime brain building tips, or a family court judge who recommends the Vroom mobile app to parents who are being reunited with their children. You can't make this stuff up and you can't guide people to do something. You have to give them the tools and then step back. I would never have thought of a judge using the Room app in his courtroom. We're also reaching parents through brands and media, including Goya Foods, who put the brain building tips right on pack. Uh, Fred Rogers Company, if you ever watch Daniel Tiger, you'll see Room Tips pre and post the episode, and it's the number one watched, co-watched television show between, with parents and children. And so that was a significant um, partnership that we brought to the table. Johnson & Johnson and Baby Box Company, to name a few. So in the United States alone, currently, Vroom is reaching 500,000 families. And that's without counting Daniel Tiger, because Daniel Tiger's in the millions. Um, we've widened the circle well beyond our community, our state, and our country. In fact, Vroom has grown into a broad movement. For example, the International Rescue Committee has translated Vroom into Arabic for use in the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan and Lebanon. I get very emotional when I think about that. We love seeing our brain building tips in Arabic. They look beautiful in Arabic, by the way. But to be clear, we're not running Vroom campaigns. We view ourselves as enablers of community efforts. By allowing everyone in a community to participate, we are creating a strategy that can leverage every asset a community has at its disposal. Museums, doctor's offices, consumer brands, grocery stores, child care centers, even prisons. We're in the women's prison system now. If we truly want to write the history of the next generation, then it's not just about one system, but looking at our collective assets. How can we leverage those assets? I did work the word leverage in. <laughs> and, and work collaboratively to identify and scale solutions. Ultimately, it's a new paradigm we're after, a culture shift in which children are placed at the center of every decision. You can unleash ideas if you give people access to knowledge. There's a real beauty in that, because who would have thought of bringing Vroom to refugee camps? Certainly I didn't. Or into women's prisons. That wasn't me either. Regarding community investments, I'd like to share a story directly with the funders in the room. 
And this is just to help define how broadly you can consider what an asset happens to be. Amazon.com had purchased property for expansion in Seattle. And on um, this property was an old travel lodge. I hope some of you are still, I'm so old, I remember staying in travel lodges. Maybe. Anyway, it's a one-story motel. Um, and um, Amazon didn't need the um, land right away. So they decided to refurbish the travel lodge and make it into a homeless shelter for mothers and children. And when those, it was time for those motels to be pulled down because they were getting ready to build, Amazon decided to donate six floors of their new building as a homeless shelter for single women with children. It is It is a quiet example of what a company can do in their community. This touches my heart so deeply because I was a single mom with my son Jeff. Um and instead of, you know, Amazon helping those women in, into a shelter someplace else, they welcomed them into their own community. Sometimes it's very difficult not fitting into society. This is taking community seriously by embracing it, sharing resources, and thinking about the greater good for everyone. And when my son Jeff was asked during a, uh, an interview, how long will you let mothers and children live in your building? His reply, in perpetuity, forever, mm -hmm. or until we fix homelessness. I promised myself I was not going to get weepy, but... Weepy is one of my strong suits. <laughs> Amazon's asset was the six floors of its new building. Our asset at the foundation is the science that we funded and shared. We all have assets, and it's not always money. Look deeper to see what you can bring to make a difference. So I'll talk about some a few other assets. I would like to see, and I'm not picking on Walmart, but I would like to actually see and hear um, as a parent goes by with a child, I, I want to not ever hear again the throwaway statement, have a nice day. I want to hear somebody say, wow, you're building a brain today. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear a bus driver when the mother makes those three steps up to the slot that she puts her, her token in, that's his asset. His asset are those three steps and his moment to look at her and say, wow, you're building a brain today. Or the bodega owner, right? Or any one of us. Wow, you're building a brain today. We all have assets. I challenge you today to find the thing that you can do and share it broadly throughout your communities for greater outcomes for children and families. And I look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thank you. What an absolutely amazing example of listening and leveraging and being authentic in the community. And I think it's just, the, that example is also a phenomenal segue to, to Bob. And would love to hear from you, Bob, about the experience of the endowment really trying to build healthy communities and sort of lifting up the power of the people. Yeah. Uh so, yeah, so thanks for having me follow Jackie. I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> like, 
Do you want me to like, cry for you? <laughs> <laughs> On cue, I'm good at it. <laughs> I feel like, like whenever Michael Jackson appeared at the Apollo Theater, whoever the poor bastard was, it followed Michael Jackson. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is, um, uh, and th thank you, uh, Mira. I found out uh, today Mira is a legend in, in Denver. Um, and someone told me there's actually a tree uh, that's planted in, in Mira's honor here somewhere. Um, and it is still alive. And it's still there. And, <laughs> You're always, you're always afraid Dogs won't go near. do those things. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, a couple of, th uh, of, um, of thoughts. So let, me, let me start with, um, I'm kind of parachuting into this issue. We're not a big funder of this issue. That said, this is also the more, most important issue that philanthropy is in, in my view, and I'll, I'll tell you why I think that in a second. Um, so, we're in a... We're in year six of a 10-year journey called Building Healthy Communities. It's a combined place-based and policy approach to health. Uh, we wanted to really view uh, communities rather than individuals as the unit of health. Uh, we uh, picked 14 um, distressed communities and said we're just going to stick with you for a while and, and work with you on, 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 on creating healthier communities or healthier places for young people. And again, with very much of, a, of, a, of an ecosystem approach, right? Um, so uh, we're, we're uh, again, six years in, about, about a half a billion dollars in this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you uh, for free in the next three minutes what I've learned um, in seven <laughs> years and, and a half a billion dollars later. Um, so, so far, let me just talk about sort of impact we've had so far. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mira, for your overly generous comments about health coverage. But that was one of the things that it was fortuitous that we were getting building healthy communities going. Mm -hmm. President Barack Obama got elected. Health reform became an issue. Obamacare got passed. Um, uh, along with Medicaid expansion. Right. And so we decided to make sure that in partnership with community leaders that we would have California as a, as a um, leaning into the implementation of Obamacare with colleagues like the Packard Foundation and, and others. So we weren't alone there. Um, and so a few years later, uh, like much of the country, we've seen tremendous gains, uh, tremendous uh, uh, improvements in health coverage, particularly in children. You know this mirror because Packard's been mm -hmm. a partner with us on that as well. Um, again, we contributed to that uh, through our Building Healthy Communities campaign. It wasn't, um, that's the contribution, not attribution. Right? Um, secondly, uh, working with, uh, aside from that issue or related to that issue, making sure that undocumented children mm -hmm. Uh, had access to coverage as well. That was a success. A lot of campaign work that was led by uh, a lot of our grantees and, and partners in the communities. Um, so those were, th those were victories we were in, sort of anticipating. We knew we would be in that space. Um, in a couple of other areas, through listening and engaging, just listening, just good, hard, leaning in, forward listening, uh, learning from leaders on the ground and communities, some of them activists, some of them young people, some of them community organizers in these, uh, across these 14 communities. We heard about a couple of things that were not on our radar screen as a health foundation. And they put it on our radar screen and challenged us to uh, support the work. And those two examples are related. Uh, one was um, school discipline reform. Mm. Um, because young people in these communities, uh, and, and when, you know, we, we sort of asked some open-ended questions around what's it going to take for your community to be healthier for young people, and this issue came up. Uh, and I remember we were at a, at a meeting in, in Fresno when I first heard it with a group of young activists. And they said, we want you to help us get rid of, of um, zero tolerance policies in schools. And I was like, what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. I thought that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. right. um, and they went on to say, this is how we get criminalized yeah. as young people 
particularly young people of color, in these school systems, right? So, um, you know, my board chair's looking at me like, did you know about this? Uh, no, didn't know about this. So we began hearing about this in other sites as well, in LA, in Richmond, in Long Beach, and started looking at the data, and the data says, oh, kids are right. There's an epidemic of school suspensions. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to um, three strikes and you're out, brought to you by the crack cocaine epidemic, mm -hmm. later 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. the nation's response, right? I mean, what you heard from Jackie, you were, heard, you were hearing Jackie describe uh, her plea for a different kind of narrative, mm -hmm. right? Brain builders. Mm -hmm. that, that's, a, that's a narrative, right? The narrative then was three strikes and you're out, right? And so what the nation embarked on was a punishment frame, a punishment narrative for a medical problem, which in this case was addiction. Right? So that goes three strikes and you're out. And so in the, in the justice system, you see a 400% increase in the prison population between the early 1990s and sort of where we are now. Uh, more quietly, on the school side, you see a 350% increase in school suspensions over the same period. Mm -hmm. And so these kids were telling us that, that they were feeling stigmatized mm -hmm. you know, by these policies and school settings. So we started sort of working, we started getting at some data, looking for school districts where, there, where some um, positive experience had happened, a courageous principal, a school district who decided to take the issue on um, kind of quietly. That led to sort of a movement primarily led by these young organizers and young people. Uh, and within, I would say, uh, it didn't happen overnight, but within three years, uh, this group of organizers had eight bills on the legislature's desk. Um, the governor signed five of them. Um, and school districts began getting sort of educated through community voice and empowerment. Um, stop suspending our kids out of school give them alternate, alternative practices. And I don't have enough time to get into, but there are alternative practices that are, that are proven aside from suspending kids out of school. And then the second issue we heard which was related, which was the prison pipeline. These were mostly communities of color, mostly black and brown communities, not entirely. Uh, one of them is a tribal community as well. Uh, but they felt that, that the, the voraciousness of the prison pipeline was decidedly unhealthy for their communities. Mm -hmm and that we needed to be a partner in helping them. And so they've, we've funded some work that has led to um, uh, advocacy for Prop 47, uh, which mm -hmm. tries to move, bring more of a prevention narrative to a punishment frame. Um, and so that's been another set of, of impactful victories. And then the, there've been a lot of local victories in these communities, more than 100 of them around health equity and, 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 and prevention. And so, um, you know, we're, sticki we're sticking with it. Place-based work, as most of you, any of you who are involved in, when you work closely with the community, it's, it's messy, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's real, it's authentic. You can't escape. We did not go into this campaign thinking about the prison pipeline and school suspensions. Um, and we're hearing a lot about housing, too. And we're a health foundation, so it's kind of like, well, we're a health foundation, we're gonna do housing. Yeah, but you know, you, you, are you with us or not, right? So it, it, there's kind of that kind of tension, but it's authentic yeah. and it's real and it's powerful. Um, I would say the, the following. Um, now I'm gonna sort of capture the six years of lessons, and this is captured in a, in a report we did, a halftime report called The Power Grid. Um, it's somewhere on our website. Think about it this way, um, because you heard about, you heard about Jackie, uh, and many of you I know are, you know, we're, a lot of us are here because of the science of brain building, mm -hmm. right? If you have that metaphor as sort of leading with the science, I want you to, I want you to try swapping that metaphor out, not for a different one, but for one that's amended, and think about the science in one hand and a fist or the other. And that, and that fist is, mean, is authentic political power through community engagement, through meaningful community engagement. Okay. 
because, uh, like it or not, we live in a nation, and it's, this is not new, quite frankly, although it's getting worse. We live in a nation where the science just can't walk into Congress and deliver policy change. Okay? I, I know we can always use more data, and I know there's always another paper to be had around brain science and kids. We have enough to know what to do. Okay? We have enough. Um, and I know there's probably researchers here, and I know you end every paper with, you know, more study needs to be done to really... No, we have enough to know. Right? And, I, and I'll, just, I'll just sort of end with, um, with uh, an analogy um, that's real. Probably those of us who have public health backgrounds and data backgrounds... Um, Tobacco is considered a big public health victory. I mean, the, the battle's not done, but we've come a long way on tobacco in this country. Right? Um, there's a new narrative on tobacco, right? Um, if, if you go to a baby shower next week and someone is smoking around babies and children, you know that something, that person's gonna get tossed out, right? That's different than 30 years ago, right? So the first journal article, a peer-reviewed journal article about the bad effects, ill effects of smoking, were in the British journal Lancet, 1921. Hmm. Hundreds of articles followed that British uh, Lancet article over the next 20, 30 years, hundreds. Okay. The Surgeon General didn't get permission from the president and Congress to put a warning label on the, tobacco, on the side of the cigarettes until 1964. So 1921, the data comes out. 1964, it's on the side of a cigarette pack. Another 30 years later before we see tobacco ads off of television and out of you know, restaurants, right? So, so we're in 2006, we're in 100 years war on tobacco. And the gap between the data and the science and real meaningful, powerful ecosystem policy change is decades. And the science on that one was clean. Right? And you know why it took that long. It wasn't because the papers weren't well done. <laughs> it wasn't that because they weren't peer-reviewed enough. It wasn't that because they didn't show up in the right kind of peer-reviewed journals, right? That was a power problem. The tobacco industry had Congress in its grips for a long time. Okay? And so I say to you, if we're going to get to scale on the brain science of children and this issue of third grade reading, we're going to have to be more intentional and assertive about thinking about political power and engaging authentic engagement of community leaders and grassroots organizations because those power games play out not just in Washington, D.C., but they play out in all kinds of ways, of course, um, in your communities. The last point I'll make as to why this is the most important um, issue that, that philanthropy can be involved with, and I thank you for being engaged on this issue. Uh, I did a sabbatical because I was, I was concerned about what was happening with young men of color, particularly young African-American men. I wanted to just spend some time like, researching everything I could get my hands on around, around um, young men of color, and the prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, I'll boil it down to this, this next 90 seconds or so. <clears throat> we know by sixth or seventh grade, statistically, and I don't believe that destiny is, that, that demographic is destiny, but statistically, kids by the time they're in the sixth or seventh grade are telling you, I'm going to jail. And those data points are the following. Being suspended out of school, even once, even once, raises your statistical likelihood, okay? Not cause and effect, it's correlation, right? Truancy, even one, increases the likelihood of having uh, bad academic outcomes and, and a higher rate of, of um, likelihood that you'll enter the juvenile justice system. 
I saw my friend Hetty Chang. Where's Hetty at? Hetty's the guru. There you go, Hetty. Um, Hetty Chang's been the guru in absenteeism data, so chronic absenteeism is another red flag. Doesn't matter what grade, you miss more than 15 days of school a year, that's a red flag. And this issue, grade level reading. Okay. So you don't have to wait until a kid has handcuffs on them at the age of 16 for getting involved with a gang. These kids are telling us really early with clarity, I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think the way our nation turns on this issue, this grade level reading issue, is the way we're going to get in front of all of that. Right? I'm sure they're early, they're, I'm, sh I'm sure the, the purists, the early childhood purists will say, well, they're actually earlier indicators, and I'm sure there are. Okay? But you could plant a flag on third grade reading proficiency in the United States of America, and this nation will do better if we can rally to that flag. So I just really want to say thank you for being in this space. Thank you for being in this work. I think it's the most important work our nation can do. And I wanted to ask Jackie a question. When, when, the, when your grandkids cut the hole in your fence, was that to get in or to get out? <laughs> both ways. <laughs> I'm assuming to get it. <laughs> I think, you know, thank you both of you for your comments because I, I really think in both examples here, you've got a sense of what we heard from Jackie was taking science to the people, right? In the example that Bob used about the research reports and really not having them translate for you for years into political action, I think there's a way to think about, we have to start coming up with a new way of doing what we need to do with the science. Where is it and when is it appropriate and um, how can you expedite the potential outcome you want to have by taking it directly to the people in a way that gives them the power and the affirmation for what it is they need to do. And I, I feel like that is just an incredible contribution that you all have made. And, and more and more, I see, whether it's technology or texting, that people are really trying to do this. Let's go to the people directly and let's cut out the, the middleman in this, right? We don't let's, have decades like it took for- Well, we don't. But what our experience at the Packard Foundation, because we've invested deep in three communities in California to really move the needle on kindergarten readiness. And we've picked four pillars. One is improve the quality of professional development for teachers who, and caregivers in the formal sector. The second is to reach the family, friends, and neighbors of, ch uh, of children in that community and support them with child development appropriate information. The third is to scale developmental screenings in those communities so that you really can get the medical community and the pediatricians involved for early identification. And the fourth is really to focus on what it's going to change, what it's going to take to change the systems that touch children and families to be responsive to their needs. And we are seeing the kind of complicated nature that you've put forward. And I, so one. A couple of things I take away from each of you, and then I want to open it up to questions, is one, really, let's get simple with what we know the evidence tells us, and let's look at the assets that we can get directly to people to empower them to act. And Bob, I think, as funders, what we need to do is to be really flexible in the way we think about how we're approaching a problem, which is where engaging the community, listening to what they have to say, and then actually engaging them in the solutions is probably, you know, that's what I take away from you and, and sort of this rapid. Yeah, but so one, so one, one example just uh, for folks to think about it. Some of you may be doing this already. 
each of you are either supporting or directly touching a life, mm -hmm. right, in the case of the parents. Um, mm -hmm. And so just ask yourself the question, of that family's life we've touched mm -hmm. in a positive, nurturing, supportive, trusting way, are they voting? Yeah. Are they voting? Um, why and why not? What would it, you know, what would it take? Um, it, it doesn't mean, now you can, you can have partnerships with getting people sort of ready to vote, but, but um, that family you have just mm -hmm. touched, nurtured, supported, is a citizen who also can be an activist. Mm -hmm. um, and the power of, of parent, parental voices, I could have told you another story about drinking and driving. We had the date on that one for a long time too. And it wasn't until, mm -hmm. say it, parents voted. mothers yeah. against drunk driving, that policy change really happened, right? right? right. So it's just sort of, it's another way to think about the families and communities you're interacting with and, and um, uh, as that bright light shines about being a brain builder, um, they're civic and community activists as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. The more I, they know about, I think the more they know about, um, their, about development, child development, and the importance of interactions, and knowing that they're, they're not with their children all day long, they're going to begin, my hope is, they will begin to be ad advocates and be um, demanding more from society. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've got time for a couple of questions from the audience, so I'd love to open it up. Yeah, Five please. minutes? <laughs> okay. Two questions. Make them good. And Jackie, we pounded we them into submission. Job. I guess we crushed it. I guess I thought you guys were. I thought you guys were advocates, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me ask the. Okay, we do have. Uh, you know what? Because the light is in my eye. Lisa Roy, go for it. So my question has to do with housing. Jackie brought up the issue of homeless moms, and here in Denver, we're expensive. We're experiencing gentrification at a rate I've never seen in the last 30 some odd years I've lived here. So I'm wondering nationally, especially in places like California, what you're doing to maintain stability for kids because that's a, a critical factor. Do you want to talk that's California? A, yeah, that's a example. tough one. I, I, in <laughs> fact, uh, we are having a family fight within the foundation right now on this issue of, of, of housing, gentrification, and displacement. Again, another one of those issues, when we first started hearing it, well, we're a health foundation, we don't do that, go to the you know, Hilton Foundation or whatever, but um, I don't have a really good answer. We're trying to figure out sort of how we get in this space that is of some value without pretending to communities that we can fix it because we can't. I, I will say, um, uh, Back to civic engagement, civic participation, and voting. I mean, a lot of these housing issues, um, you know, scaling back funding for HUD is, let's just say that's not going to help, A. But B, most of these decisions are local. They're land use issues, they're developer issues, they're cozy things between developers and, and city council or, or county board of supervisors. And again, I can't, under, I can't underscore enough that the families we are supporting and nurturing, they want to see they want to see brain building not just for their child, for every child in their community. Yeah. And so I think raising the stakes and encouraging them to be activist citizens, holding elected officials accountable and voting them out if they're not, um, I think has a, has an upside benefit for those of us who care about you know opportunity for families. So I don't have a really good answer for that. Um, other than um, uh, civic engagement. The, the only thing I would add, I think Bob is right to that, is what we are doing is we're funding um, business organizations, business membership organizations, like the LA Chamber, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, the Bay Area Council, and really asking the business community to start to address these issues, because it's a workforce issue for them as well. So it's 
who are your, who are the folks that you need, stakeholders that you really need to get involved, and, and you know, there's got to be a value proposition for them on that. But it is, it's a tough, it's a tough issue in housing. We have a minute and 34 seconds left. This clock up here is just pretty amazing. If there isn't another question, I just, please join me in thanking our guests here t today. And thank you to all of you for the great work that you do. And I have to say, 300 communities, if we can't really get politi political activism out of the 300 communities to start to impact what has to happen in the midterm elections, let me just say that before I go. Let's get the vote out, folks. Yeah, I, I, wish, I wish you guys, I wish you guys, there's Democrats and there's Republicans, I wish you guys were a political party. Okay? <laughs>